Friends, this is the second year of a new series, Saturdays with the Saints. It gives us an opportunity to think for a minute on Saturday when we're going to go to a football game and have fun. Also about, about the saints, uh, people who stretch our imagination. The saints aren't just for the church, friends. The saints are the church for the rest of the world, too, because the saints are kind of lights, as Benedict has said. The saints are people who enable us to see realms of human possibility that we hadn't seen before. Um, holiness introduces us to mystery that we hadn't seen before, and so we want to go farther, and we want to see more. And that's the idea of this Saturday with the Saints series, so that we can all learn to see a little more and a little farther. And friends, this morning I have the honor of introducing my colleague, Cyril O'Regan. Cyril O'Regan is the Husking Chair of Theology in the Department of Theology right here at the University of Notre Dame. Professor O'Regan is no stranger to the saints. <laughs> His academic work, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> on Newman and on the other saints is out there in article form, but also in a more fundamental way. What are the possibilities for holiness in the world? What are the possibilities for holiness in the modern world? And what are the intellectual, what is the intellectual foundation that you need to have in order to articulate the continuing possibility of holiness in the modern world? A world which seems in a way so bent on denying, obscuring, ruling out, foregoing the very possibility of holiness, which is asked to blend in to look like something else, less than itself, mysteriously less mysterious. Moralism, professionalism, easily mistaken for light. Cyril's work in theology has laid the groundwork for the intellectual defense of holiness in our own time through his projected seven volume history of modern theology, three volumes of which are already completed talking about modern theology as a, as a Gnostic return in modernity and offering glimpses of the seeds of a counter vision emerging also. In his work on the philosopher Hegel as having provided the hidden narrative for this Gnostic return in contemporary theology and with it almost the self erasure of theology as a discipline in favor of philosophy and in favor of a way of thinking about the intellectual life where reason trumps faith, as it were. What are the possibilities for a new dialectic between faith and reason? This is what Cyril's work is showing in so many ways. And finally, a new 700-page book on Hans Urs von Balthasar will be coming out very soon from Crossroads entitled the Anatomy of Misremembering. And just for the title, it's worth buying the book. <laughs> <laughs> Focused as he is on laying the foundational groundwork for a renewed vision of theology, and with it, a renewed theological articulation and defense of the possibility of holiness in the modern world, how appropriate that he's going to speak to us today about one of the saints who was herself a living demonstration of the possibility of holiness in the modern world, and so herself a light, as well as one of those who helped to lay the philosophical foundations for an intellectual defense of this possibility that is of holiness, Edith Stein. So please join me in welcoming Cyril O'Regan, who's going to speak to us today on Edith Stein and the Dark Knight. First, thank you, John, my best friend, as always. <laughs> Edith Stein, whose taken name was Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, was beatified by John Paul II in 1987 
and canonized in 1999. It was expected that there would be more than the usual debate about this particular canonization, even allowing for John Paul II's prodigality in the Declaration of Saints. And there was. There are two main criticisms that came from Jewish quarters and were echoed by Catholics. The first was the raising up of a Catholic who died in the Holocaust. It took the light away from the mass extermination of Jews. And second, the fact that Stein was a Jewish convert showed the kind of insensitivity towards Judaism that made the policies of the Third Reich possible. There were defenders who answered the objections, some insisting on the prerogatives of the church to do things for its own community. What is more important, however, than the arguments that ensued were the motives for John Paul II who rarely appealed to the rights of the church and who cannot be accused of insensitivity to Judaism. He is the Pope who wished to show that its relationship to Judaism, that in its relationship to Judaism, the Catholic Church is much more the church penitent than militant. And the last thing that John Paul II was interested in doing is putting Jews in their places by insisting that Catholics also died in the concentration camps. He accepted that the concentration camp system was primarily for Jews and other undesirables, and not specifically for Christians. So why do it? There is a stated reason. Edith Stein led a compelling life of witness to the love of God in Christ that the church confesses. Unstated reasons undoubtedly include the judgment that Edith Stein concentrated in her life of witness elements which are not always, are even often seen together. A life of prayer and renunciation and the life of the intellect. And a contemplative intellectual life and the fate of the martyr. John Paul II was convinced that Catholics should be consoled and cheered by examples of the saints, especially in the modern world, where we might think that they are impossible. The many examples that he holds up suggest that the possibility of sainthood is shown by the fact. For John Paul II, what was truly important about a saint was what he, that he or she is iconic, which means that saints point to particular ways of being faithful to Christ and make transparent particular aspects of the divine love disclosed in Christ who is the icon of icons, the archetype and model of all icons. And John Paul II had special reasons for the canonization. While he did not want in any way to challenge Jewish specialness with respect to the death camps. He did want to show up Catholics who lost their lives in the camps, knowing full well that many Catholics behaved abysmally. He also felt that we could look at Edith Stein as showing us how Judaism and Christianity should be seen as intimate, with a suggestion that Christianity cannot afford to leave Judaism out of the economy of salvation. John Paul II spoke of Stein as both eminent daughter of Israel and a faithful daughter of the church and went on to say, through the experience of the cross, Edith Stein was able to open up the way to a new encounter with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. John Paul II had a personal as well as papal stake in getting us to see the latter point. The point would not have been lost on his Polish brothers and sisters in World War II. Perhaps there was also something personal about the canonization in that Edith Stein was a source of inspiration for his philosophy of the body. They traveled a very similar intellectual road 
from the rigors of that philosophical movement called phenomenology, which I will give a digest later, through St. Thomas Aquinas, to the attempt to bring the two together, but in the light of their service to a God of boundless and infinite love. And in this service, prayer was the bedrock of intellectual work, and intellectual work was finally the expression of prayer, which is the dialogue between ourselves and the triune God who infinitely surpasses us. What may be this display of unity in this irreducible particularity of a life also is iconic, in that in the modern world, there seems to be an irresistible tendency to pull them apart and to fall into an unreflective division of labor. It is important to point out that for John Paul II, it is the iconic nature of the saint that matters, not the status, which is always immeasurably beneath that of Christ. The saint is the object of our respect and even our love, but not our worship. The saint is a light for the world and a light to us. And through the saint we see Christ and are shown ways, more than one, to live the life of discipleship, which is the good news and bad news all in once, because this life holds the prospect at every moment of truly exorbitant cost. The saint is an icon in motion. The saint is not a static figure, but always a life in which there is discovery, conversion, progress, and sometimes backsliding. The life of Edith Stein illustrates the general rule, while at the same time being totally unique and particular. And the basic outline of this life is not difficult to tell. Edith is born in 1891 into a relatively prosperous Jewish family. Her father dies when she is two, leaving her devout Jewish mother with seven children to raise. Her mother turns out to be an accomplished businesswoman, so the family is financially comfortable growing up. And despite her mother's best intentions, Edith does not grow up devout. She is strong-willed, fairly precocious, and grows up to be an intellectually gifted young woman. And as she turns 20, she gets caught up in the movement in philosophy that goes by the name of phenomenology, a form of philosophy that insists on the return to experience. In the pursuit of this new line of experiential investigation in philosophy, she comes to study with the founder of the movement, that is Edmund Husserl, who though president also has a Jewish background. Now, the movement of phenomenology was not just one more local shift of intellectual taste in the 20th century. For Stein and for other early 20th century intellectuals, it represented nothing less than a revolution in philosophical method, how fundamentally we approach reality. Simply stated, on this view, the entire philosophical tradition is a tissue of concepts that more often conceal and disclose what is given in experience regarding our bodies, time, memory, hope, other selves, our experiences of love, our experiences of hate, our experiences of art, and our experiences of the divine. We have to get beneath or behind these concepts to get at something real and put ourselves in a position whereby we can judge what is more or less useful or real in the philosophical tradition. Stein's dissertation submitted in 1916 was on the experience of empathy. Our empathy with other selves who are centers of consciousness and agency, but also and especially vulnerable to suffering in body and spirit. The topic of empathy was an interest that she shared with another phenomenologist of the period, that is Max Scherler, who is an important influence on John Paul II's elaboration of Christian personalism. Success at the dissertation, yes indeed, she got some cum laude, neither immediately nor in the long run turned into an academic position. 
although she became and remained an assistant of Husserl for some time. There was first the problem of being a woman. In due course, there was an even more serious problem of being a Jew. The key moment in Stein's life came in, 19, came in 1921, when left alone in the house of her friend with nothing to do, she picks up and reads the autobiography of Teresa Avila, the 16th century Carmelite, whom John Paul II made the first doctor of the church. The experience was overwhelming for Stein. Teresa had done nothing less in her view than revealed the truth, capital, which is encapsulated in the love that God has for us and our love for God that God makes possible. For her, this knowledge is practical as well as theoretical. It demands a change in her fundamental orientation and how she should lead her life. This is a conversion experience and bears all kinds of relation to the conversion of St. Augustine recounted in the Confessions. Not only is there in 1921 something equivalent to Tole Lege, take up and read of book uh, eight of the Confessions, but this moment crystallizes, as in Augustine, subtle changes in perception, attitude, belief, and practice that have been happening over a number of years. It is a moment also to start from. It is a beginning, indeed, the beginning. The life of Teresa is iconic for Stein, although it will take years before she takes up the way of the cross and enters a Carmelite convent. There is no particular repugnance with respect to the thought, but there is the issue of discernment, the complication of our intellectual vocation, the need to be more fully embedded in the Catholic Church, and above all, the problem of her mother, <laughs> whom Stein feels as a devout Jew is able to sustain conversion to Catholicism, but not her entry into an enclosed religious order. The conversion leads to baptism and confirmation the following year, 1922, and a change in employment status. As Stein leaves behind, behind the role of assistant to her beloved Husserl and begins life at a Dominican educational institute which covers both high school students and trains teachers. She teaches at the institute for eight years. Her conversion opens up a host of relations with other Catholic intellectuals, most notably Eric Shivara, who was an original synthetic intellect, as well as a profound reader of Augustine and John Henry Newman, not an interestingly both of themselves converts. Stein continued to eke out for 10 years a kind of academic existence, translating works of religious interest from Spanish into German and from English into German. She translated John Henry Newman. And talking and writing widely on the relationship between faith and reason, as well as on women, and more particularly on what now would be called the question of sexual difference. She was also part of a larger movement which involved the rediscovery of Thomas Aquinas, which included Jacques Maritain, as it did Shivara. And this had to do with Aquinas, who could speak to the concerns of the present moment. That is, Aquinas read to have an experiential dimension which made sense of his intellectual judgments concerning our relation to God, the world, and to each other. And in the middle of the late 30s, she produced her masterpiece in Aquinas called Finite and Infinite Being, which continued to show her commitment to phenomenology, but also indicating that Teresa of Avila, who brought her to the church, never deserted her. In the German edition of the text, there is a long appendix on Teresa. This large and unweirdly text did not get published in her lifetime. The period in the 30s also saw her entrance into the Carmelites, which called which caused a real rift as feared between herself and her mother. And the final vows were taken in 1938. And while Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross was one Carmelite in the convent of 20 and came under the rule of St. Teresa Avila, she was allowed to engage in intellectual work and gave talks away from the convent. By all accounts, Stein was a happy Carmelite convinced that prayer and renunciation brought one closer to God, 
but also to other selves, by breaking down what impedes pure openness to God's grace. She knew that what got in the way was our ignorance, our vanity, our pride. And she believed that the pairing away of this false self was a condition of the emergence of a human being who is truly a person and truly relational. She had also an uncommonly unblinkered view of the Third Reich and saw with alarm the rising hostility towards Jews in the 30s. In fact, she struck a more than usually ominous note with respect to the likely fate of the Jews, which already was one, in her view, of protracted and immense suffering. With the implementation of the racial purity laws, however, the Carmelite order moved her to Holland in 1938, which was deemed at that point to be safe. It turned out for obvious reasons not to be so. The Dutch Catholic Church's protest against the Jewish policy of the Third Reich in 1942 brought about the reprisal that all Catholics of Jewish extraction would be treated in the same way as Jews and deported. With her sister Rosa, who had entered contemplative life after her mother died in the late uh, 30s, Edith was arrested in early August of 1942, was transferred to Auschwitz, was gassed immediately on arrival, and was buried in a mass grave. She left behind her sisters and the faith, siblings in Europe and the US, and an intellectual world which took her very seriously. And on her desk, she left an unfinished commentary on St. John of the Cross, the other great Carmelite saint, which was commissioned for the 400th anniversary of his birth. The title of this is The Science of the Cross. The title Science of the Cross <coughs> proves misleading unless we recall two of the main sources of Stein's thought, phenomenology on the one hand and Carmelite spirituality on the other. In classic texts of phenomenology, there is much talk of science but the science referred to is neither that of the natural or humanist sciences, nor is it conceptual style philosophy. Rather, science is the discipline of describing a particular phenomenon as adequately as possible and tracing the lines of relations with other phenomena. In short, science is experiential all the way through. From Carmelite spirituality, Stein learned that there exists an intuited center from which everything else flows in an ordered way in the spiritual life. What is at the center is the cross of Christ. And what that suggests in terms not only of what we see, but what we do and how we shape our lives. Crucially, the way of the cross is not marked by consolations and spiritual ecstasies the kinds of gifts that might encourage the man or woman on the journey to feel self-satisfied in that one finds one's efforts rewarded. In her commentary, which is arguably her second masterpiece, Stein thinks of the science of the cross as finding its experiential center in concepts and images of darkness. The darkness that seems to testify more nearly to the absence of God than God's presence the abandoning of all hope rather than a sustaining, the darkness that speaks to the dryness of spirit, its desert, rather than the spirit which has been irrigated by divine gift. Notice that in St. John of the Cross, darkness is not simply a function of the fact that God and darkness go together insofar as God is infinite and we are finite, and therefore our knowledge is inadequate regarding God, indeed a form of ignorance, even if special in kind. Overall, Stein has no doubt that darkness is the site of love. Indeed, it's the crossing point of all human and divine love. Our love for God and our love for each other and God's love for us, which enables us to love the other and perhaps even to love ourselves. She says at one point, Carmel is about nothing else than the love of God. But for her, this love embraces all of reality. 
John Paul II does not forget this in his homily on the canonization. Love is perception. Love is action. Love is form of life. And it is revealed in extreme moments of our lives, which are lives of trial, where we waver between constancy and inconstancy. When it comes to St. John of the Cross, we can say that there is no mystic of the Christian tradition, with possibly the exception of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, where the emphasis so clearly and sharply falls on love. And certainly there's no mystic in the Christian tradition who is quite the poet. John writes original poems that are effectively the companion of the Song of Songs, and then proceeds to interpret them in the way other mystics interpret the Song of Songs, as being the nuptials of the church in Christ and the individual in Christ. And perhaps, and most importantly, no mystic is as emphatic about the gap between our expectation and God's disclosure to us in hiddenness, which can seem like a divine absence. In the obscure dark, la, la notte oscura, God seems absent. The love of the soul does not meet with a consoling presence. The dark is paradoxical and genuinely holy. It is a trial of the greatest renunciation in which God cannot be a prop and in which we need a faith beyond faith, a hope beyond hope, and a love beyond love. Now one of the more adequate modern verbal expressions of St. John of the Cross's central insight can be found in T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. The third section, and particularly the third section of the second of the four poems, is Cocker, begins with the lines, O dark, 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 they all go into the dark. While this could be an evocation of John of the Cross, it could also refer, I suppose, to any number of texts in the Western literary tradition or evoke the Psalms, or perhaps none of these things. But the John of the Cross has been recalled as suggested when ten lines or so later we find, I said to my soul, be still, and let the dark come upon you, which is the darkness of God. And the recall of St. John of the Cross is demonstrated when the dialogue between the eye and the soul continues, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be the hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be the love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Eliot knew what John but the cross knew that the deepest form of life is not about the subtleties of knowing, even finding out that there is a non-grasping, non-controlling form of knowing. More important is a non-controlling, recepting, receptive and accepting form of existence towards others and the world, and especially the divine person that grounds everything a life steeped in gratitude for each day, for each encounter, for friends and family, for a book read or left unread because there's something more important to do. Gratitude here responding to what is rightly perceived as gift. And St. John of the Cross is able to illustrate in and through a mastery of language that is a match for his spiritual insight what Christian life is truly about. But it is not as if Edith has displaced St. Teresa from her affections. John and Teresa are brother and sister to her. The hyperbole of the one, John, is balanced by the sharp no-nonsense of the other. The drama that is the hallmark of the spiritual life for John is balanced by Teresa's emphasis on the progress of the karma life which cannot be expected to run absolutely smoothly. Nor does Edith see that a choice has been made between St. John of the Cross and Thomas Aquinas. If John of the Cross is a rigorous thinker as well as an ecstatic, then Thomas Aquinas is a spiritual master as well as the greatest of scholastics 
and the thinker, the match of the modern greats, even or especially her beloved Edmund Husserl, and greater than the thinker, who in the eyes of many displaced Husserl, Martin Heidegger, who traveled a very different path in Stein, having had, among other things, a serious flirtation with nationalist socialism. Stein's commentary on the works of St. John of the Cross is so extraordinarily faithful as sometimes to seem almost slavish. But since the time of her conversion from reading Teresa's life, her adopted name, she understood that truth, capital T, has leverage over all our sophistications. John speaks the truth, as did Teresa, and one bows to this. But one is bowing to the truth, not to them, although one is extraordinarily grateful to them for the way in which they made the truth transparent. We are to give ourselves up in trust so that the lavish but not demonstrative love of God will sustain us in all the hours of our life and the great hour of our death. We give ourselves up in a faith beyond faith, a hope beyond hope, and a love that can never grasp its object. And God is beyond all our technique. The faith, the hope, and the love which remain unextinguished in the darkest hours of our lives are not simply ours. The community of Carmel is not just a stage prop for each sister to become a member of a spiritual elite. The love of community makes love essentially communitarian. One wishes that the love of God transform all hearts and that the fire of love would be lit outside as well as inside the enclosure. This love is profligate, having no measure either in terms of depth or scope. We cannot even say that it begins and ends in the church, for there are the original pilgrims, the Jews from whence our Lord comes. Going into the dark as going into the light is not something that a person who is truly a person does alone. In the convent, each sister remains tied to every other in love. But the convent is only the site of the experiment in which the world is reformed and brought back to its proper self. The move from the convent to the world is to be nothing more than a leaven. And in the real and baleful history of the era of the Third Reich, there is darkness that is just the opposite of the darkness of God into which we can move with trust. One week after she is taken by the Gestapo from a convent and transported to the death camps of Eastern Europe, Edith Stein is dead, gassed with, with some fellow Catholic Jews, including her sister Rosa, her friend Renata Frederike Kantorowitz, who also typed her manuscripts, and her godchild, Elise Maria Reyes. She and her sisters in faith die with numerous other Jews, to whom she always felt tied, and with whose suffering she wished to be in solidarity to the mystery of the suffering of the Jewish Christ. Going into the dark night is going into the night with them in the conviction that God's lavish love reaches them in this night of history and insanity. From the vantage point of John Paul II, Stein is nothing less than the parable of what Jewish Christian relations can be in their tonality. A hospitality that is grounded in the love of God that is stronger than death and harder than hell. And this is why it would have served neither Jewish nor Christian purposes for her canonization to have been held up. The point is not to create another idol, but to put forth an icon, allowing us to see what a pure waiting on God in a horrendous moment in history looks like where the waiting is not solitary, but the waiting with and the waiting for others, and especially with her Jewish brothers and sisters. This waiting, which is recommended to be a posture in all moments, in all activities, domestic, manual, intellectual, is also waiting in the hour of our death, whether this comes naturally 
or for or from the insanity of history. In the darkness of an unjust death, there is an even greater darkness of God, which is coming to meet all who are in Auschwitz. The science of the cross is not simply piety. It is the stance towards the horrors of history. This is the stance of Edith as she makes her way naked towards the ovens with her Jewish and Catholic Jewish sisters in Auschwitz. When Stein dies in conscious solidarity with her Jewish and Christian sisters, her commentary on St. John of the Cross, the Science of the Cross, lay unfinished on the table in her cell in the convent at Echt in Holland. What is crucial about this science is that it has as its model the discipleship presented in the Gospels where supernatural faith, hope, and charity replace our standard operating procedures. Stein recognizes with Eliot that here faith, hope, and love have lost the objects to which they usually refer and are purified in the dark knowledge which is the knowledge of God. The foundational poem of all poems in the corpus of St. John of the Cross is The Dark Night, not Jaoskore. Here are verses one and four in Stein's own rendition, which rings some small changes on John. First verse. One dark night, as love's yearning did inflame me, I escaped unnoticed, O oh, happy fate, I escaped unnoticed when my house lay at rest so still. And for, and this conducted me far surer than the light of brightest day, thence where for me eagerly was waiting, he whom I knew so well, aside there where no one could part us. John is a guide towards the cross. He is our companion. But the cross is a decision. It will be embraced or be refused by us. The final word should be given to Edith Stein or Sister Teresa Benedicta of the cross. I quote from the sign in the Science of the Cross, which is more testimony than book. No human heart had ever entered as dark a night as did the God-man in Gethsemane and on Golgotha. No searching human spirit can penetrate the unfathomable mystery of the dying God-man's abandonment by God. There are his most faithful friends from whom he exacts the final test of their love. If they do not shrink back from it, but allow themselves to be drawn willingly into the dark night, it will become their leader. This is the great experience of the cross, extreme abandonment, and precisely in this abandonment, union with the crucified. Cross and the night are the way to heavenly light. That is the joyful message of the cross. Thank you. It's hard to say. I, I suspect maybe not. Um, sainthood is for us, not for the saint, in some sense. So this sort of is written into the fabric of her life, is purely contingent. Um, she would have been a parable of something else. Um, she would have been a parable, in particular, of how the intellectual life and contemplative life can go together. So I think the, as I was talking, I think I had two different kind of foci. One was, I think, to say that John Paul II certainly emphasized what I've just said. That is, she showed sort of how uh, high intellectual work and holiness 
and contemplation can go together. But the second thing, of course, is that she brings both of those together, and she's a martyr. I, that's why I have trouble, because she was killed for being a Jew, not for being a, a Catholic or a Christian. Well, this, of course, was an neuralgic point, uh, and I think sort of it's, it's a complex situation in some sense. She was, of course, ultimately killed because she was a Jew. I mean, that's the pretext of it. But had it been the case that the Catholic bishops had not denounced uh, the Jewish policy in the Reich, she probably would not have been killed. In other words, there was a kind of gentleman's agreement, so that you know that we won't touch yours if you obey. The Catholic Church did not obey. Uh, the other churches, so that you know, various things did, in fact, so that you know, kind of not c come out quite in the way the Archbishop did. So I, I think this is a, is a mixed thing that one can perfectly well understand. Um, a Jew making the objection, which, which was made, and I think sort of which uh, I think John Paul II, I think, heard, that she was killed because she was a Jew. And that is true, but it's not the whole truth. Uh, she would not have been killed uh, if sort of there was not a stance by Catholics at that particular moment uh, in sort of a kind of misbegotten history of the relationship of the Catholic Church or to Jews. Uh, there were moments of light, and this was one moment of light sort of know in Holland. So she was killed because this was a reprisal against uh, the archbishop siding with Jews. She probably would have been safe. Uh, it would have turned out also that some of the people sort of most likely sort of to uh, be exposed to danger in the long run, we're not saying she would be absolutely safe, but she certainly would have been safe at that point. Uh, there was uh, efforts to get people to Switzerland, which was actually safe. It turned out sort of just uh, in the kind of bitter irony of history that the papers which would have got her uh, to Switzerland came three weeks too late. So three weeks too late. So, so the point, point accepted, but I think sort of it's a, it's a mixed thing. Uh, and uh, I think that this sort of, you know, was duly considered by John Paul II. And I think it's an unbalanced decision. Um, I think he knew sort of that there would sort of you know, be some reaction. I think that he, I think he needed sort of for the sake of the church. It's a light to the world and a light to the church. The church need, needed to know not to console itself with respect sort of, you know, to a very mixed sort of, you know, relationship sort of, you know, to what happened in World War II. But that's sort of, you know, what, was the, what was the right way of behaving? What was the right way of standing firm? And that's a message we need not simply with respect to retrospectively, retroactively. We need that message to go forward. Saints are there to help us go forward as well as to recall sort of what we've done and what we failed to do. I probably half anticipated that question. Of course, this this is a this is the point, sort of, you know, where sort of uh, you know one does not achieve consensus, right? Um, I, I'm simply descri describing the lay of the land. I'm not actually giving any any personal opinion on this matter. Um, Clearly, sort of, you know, she sort of, you know, articulated a view of women that John Paul II sort of found extraordinarily hospitable. That is that she distinguished, it seems to me, sort of, between sort of, uh, what the rights of women are, sort of, you know, what they ought to have access to. I mean, she was denied access to academic position because she was a woman and so forth. So she believed sort of strongly that a woman could do anything sort of, that a man could do and should be allowed to do anything that a man could do. It seems to me she wanted to distinguish between sort of that that is, what we, what we might call sort of the, the politics sort of, you know, of gender from sort of a, a view of gender such that uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, therefore, between access, uh, where males have access, and therefore sort of access becomes, well, women become males sort of by in and through sort of the politics sort of you know, equalization. Her view was that uh, women, and she would now be criticized uh, as an essentialist and so forth, um, her view was that in general, um, the disposition of a woman is not the same as the disposition of a man. Uh, she talks sort of about a woman's receptivity. Uh, she talks sort of about a woman's vulnerability, which is probably another way of talking about receptivity. 
And she thought sort of that um, that should be owned. In other words, that as a woman sort of you know, gets rights sort of an access and so forth, um, that particular feminine quality sort of should not be excised as the price sort of you know, for that admittance. Now, in terms sort of you know, of philosophy or in terms sort of you know, of the way in which we speak about gender, clearly her position sort of you know, would be put in the camp of uh, she is stating that women, a woman sort of has X kind of qualities, uh, not allowing sort of you know, for the vast sort of variety sort of qualities women have or the malleability sort of you know, with respect sort of you know, to construction and so forth. So it's a neurologic point in the sense that sort of it will be debated. So um, persons sort of, you know, who tend to think that, well, there are some essential distinctions between men and women are more inclined towards her. People who think sort of, that the kind of characteristics that she identified as feminine are indeed the characteristics that mark also uh, women from men are, will be even more strongly sort of moved towards her. And then there will be sort of people who think sort of, that, A, there is no essential, there's no essential distinction between men and women. Uh, it's all socially constructed. Uh, or, probably a bit more narrowly, that um, it may be the case that there is something essentially differential between women and men, but she didn't get it, etc. So, to some extent, I suppose, um, at this particular moment in history, one thinks sort of, you know, of Edith Stein, put it this way, the referendum on Edith Stein's view of women is the same as a referendum on John Paul II's view of women, essentially. Uh, so I leave it descriptive, I, I, have an, uh, I have an opinion on the matter, but my opinion does not matter. Um, <laughs> what does matter sort of is that uh, this sort of is something that sort of she provides, provides us to think. Um, it's a challenge. John Paul II most certainly did take up the challenge. And I think part of his personal attraction, there were other reasons of course, I mean, martyr, intellect, contemplative and so forth. Um, these were the essential reasons. But I do think sort of that he had sort of a particular liking for her. That is, um, I said sort of in passing is, I mean, in one sense, it's just a kind of factoid and uh, not to be entertained sort of too much seriously. But John Paul II, I mean, really did have a very peculiar education for a pope. He's very peculiar in many ways, too, and all of them are probably sort of fairly good. I mean, he's a Polish pope. He was a Polish intellectual. Uh, he studied phenomenology. Scheler, sort of, whom, whose name I introduced, was not just simply a name. Uh, Scheler was someone sort of, that he studied deeply. Um, he, like Edith Stein, sort of turned to Thomas Aquinas, thought he could actually sort of bring the two together, and in fact did bring, t bring the two together. And then at the same time, he's a charismatic. So it's quite extraordinary that uh, the complexion of John Paul II as sort of a spiritual intellectual uh, really is an exact replica of what we've actually find in Edith Stein. So this kind of massive intellectual affinity also then sort of uh, reflects itself sort of in particular views, particularly sort of the views of respect to women. Can I just ask, uh, I actually don't recall that. Uh, I'm sure if it was the case, and I don't know everything about Edith Stein, I'm sure if that was the case, it, it was handled in the process. Uh, I've read a fair... Come in on this, on this one. What she wrote about was the uh, perception of women in the diaconate. The diaconate, not... not Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Why did she feel so close to the saints? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, because, well, I mean, just so, it tells you the power of a book. 
She was alone many, many years ago. She had nothing to do. And she opened the book. And it wasn't the gospel. It wasn't the Bible. It was a story, um, an autobiography, someone writing about themselves as to where they came from in terms of their religious life and where they ended up. So that's the, the first book that she reads, which is the book that has a profound effect on her, is a book about a person, a woman, hundreds of years ago, uh, who decides that um, the ordinary way of being a Christian is not enough. I need to go further. And then she's thinking of this person. This person sort of is revealing something to her, something that she didn't feel that she wanted, but now she actually feels she does want, and she's wanted all her life. So she starts out with a saint, and she ends up with a saint. The other saint that I've been talking about, and I'm sure in ways that we did not understand, but the other saint, the first saint, was Saint Teresa of Avila. The second saint, and these are the kind of bookends of her life. Right, saints are the bookends. It is a fantastic question. These are the bookends of her life. The two things which are the most important thing. She starts with one, one saint. She ends with another saint. And it's in and through her reading of saints and what they say and the way in which they order their lives around what they say that that gives meaning to her whole life. It shapes her whole life. And it's in and through saints that she gets to the gospel. <clears throat> it's in and through saints that she gets to the gospel. And the reason why that is so is that for her, the gospel is not a collection of words. For her, the gospel is a collection of pledges that we live in response to those particular words. And so the gospel sort of is a life. And then... We have St. Teresa of Avila, we have St. John of the Cross, and anyone knows well um, that Edith Stein wrote all kinds of hideographies. I mean, it's kind of part, so they've known all kind of keeping her pen, so they're taking over, so they've known she kind of wrote, so they've known about other saints, particularly saints of the common like order, so they've known which uh, moves, so they've known from the 16th century on. So she always thought that. What it means to be a Christian is not to read words, not to say words, but to transform those words to live into a life, or to transform them into a movie picture where we have characters uh, who behave in real ways. That, I think, sort of is what uh, I try to indicate by the icon in motion. Uh, it's a movie kind of real thing, because what happens, I think, with respect to saints is that we generally tend to think of them sort of, you know, as small statues as opposed to big statues. The saints are not statues. <laughs> saints are not statues. Um, saints, are, saints are in motion. Um, and saints are in motion, and the reason why they differ from us sort of is that we reveal less. We reveal less in the saint. I mean, all Christians reveal something. Saints, I take it, when we say that they're iconic, is they reveal more about the love of God and Christ than the rest of us. And... When I indicated a contrast between status and icon, I think that John Paul II, I mean, the guy was Pope, but and of course you're going to have to go through sort of that there are kind of juridical procedures and miracles and so forth. But it seems as if, well, that, that, that's kind of pro forma. That's not really where the center of the action lies. The center of the action lies in what this particular person in their life and the degree to which if they write that their lives and their writing match. To what extent so they reveal something beyond themselves? It's easy for any one of us to say, well, it's not about me. Every prof said, well, yeah, I'm going to teach you today, but it isn't about me. Well, maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, you see, you know, there's a rather famous philo current philosopher who makes a rather wonderful distinction between the icon and the idol. Idols. Suppose for the moment so that all of you idolize me. And, and my family doesn't idolize me, so you'll be the first. You know. <laughs> but, but, if, but if you did, if you did idolize me, whatever that would look like, uh, 
it would mean that I am it, and that there is a relationship between you and I, aside from the slavishness of it, that somehow or other, so that you know, your thinking and your emotion ends here. Right? Now, I take it that the problem sort of, you know, of saints throughout the history has been so that sometimes we tend to think in that particular way. So when Martin Luther came, came upon the scene, presumably that was the problem. That is, he thought that what had happened was that saints, if you like, get in between, they're opaque mediums uh, between the believer and Christ. That is, the saints become idols. John Paul II, however, uh, is perfectly clear. We don't mean, when we say someone is an icon, I know that there are football icons and so forth, and of course, what we really should say is, we should change the language. We should have, that we have football idols, not icons. <laughs> We have religious icons because the saint, in a real and genuine way, is illustrating every moment of the day, it is not about me. And while they are unique uh, and irreplaceable, and that's important, that, and that it's also important that we have many saints because we have many different, act, many different refractions of the love of God. And John Paul II, even though there seems to be a loss for the saints, is exactly right. It's not as if, you know, we have a kind of upper story, so that then we should kind of keep it underpopulated, so that, you know, for kind of quality control. <laughs> it, it is that, where, can, where, is, where is God's love seen? And particularly, where is it seen sort of in dark times? That's what an icon is, and that's precisely not an idol. If we had had that sense in the 16th century, 15th century, if as a community we have had that sense, uh, then things might have turned out rather differently. We cannot afford to have, as Christians or as Catholics, other and more idols. The icon is the shattering of all idols. And of course, Christ is the greatest shatterer of all. One last question. Was there a specific miracle attributed to her? Uh, there was. I, I assume so. That, I mean, there had to be. I mean, sort of, uh, in order to get blessed, there's a miracle, and then so that there's a second one, so between sort of uh, becoming beatified, and, and that miracle was? The one miracle. The one miracle. Uh, a young woman named McCarthy took an overdose of a small child. Her uh, family had had. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and then McCarthy actually worked for an institute for church life program. And so we come full circle. <laughs> <laughs>